introduce you? Please. Okay. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Tom Smith, who everyone knows. Very brief, huh? Very brief. Um, sorry for the delay in all of this. Um, Tom uh, has been with us for a long time and is up for a distinguished professorship, and we'll review his illustrious career, and I will let him review it. Okay. Oh. Thanks, Dan. Um, I don't know if I'm up for distinguished or extinguished, but, you know, <laughs> here I am. It's great to be here today. <laughs> um, so, basically, what I, what I want to do today is to... Um, to cover a number of themes that my lab's been involved in to give you sort of an overview of what I've been up to over the last um, 40 years. And, uh, but, and then briefly uh, zero in on one of these items, one of the research themes, which is the importance of gradients in a changing world, which is what I want to focus on today. Since I was an undergraduate, I've been fascinated with resource polymorphisms, both in terms of uh, differential niche utilization, but also uh, their importance in uh, uh, speciation, incipient speciation. My first paper on this actually goes back 37 years uh, <laughs> to a paper I published in Auk in 1982, which uh, looked at the hook-billed kite, which is a neotropical species of raptor that shows the bill size polymorphism and um, is, um, then is, is, is caused or driven by uh, different tree snails, sizes of tree snails on which it feeds. This work led eventually into my work on African seed crackers, the uh, finch pyronestes. And this, in this group, uh, we have morphs uh, that, uh, three different morphs. Morphs were found to breed randomly with respect to bill size. The differences in bill size were driven by hardnesses and seeds. And this became a, a, essentially a textbook example of disruptive selection. And, you know, we did uh, breeding experiments with this group. We brought birds back from Africa. We bred them in captivity. And the uh, pedigree analysis was consistent with, a, with, was consistent with a single gene of large effect. Um, this led to some developmental work uh, looking at uh, bill size uh, and how it's, uh, how it's uh, generated in development. But the, the genetic basis of the polymorphism remained elusive until a group of us uh, got together. This included uh, Bridget Van Holt, who was one of Bob's students, and this very cool professor, uh, I think his name is Kirk Lohmuller, um, got together and decided to really take a, take a full genomic look at this. And, and over time, we discovered that um, the growth factor seems to play an important role in determining uh, bill size. And so, this is a really uh, uh, an exciting development because it was the first time that IGF-1 was uh, seen as uh, important in avian bill size and it opens up a whole new realm of uh, possible studies looking at the role of IGF-1 in bills and birds. Another area that um, that I've been very much involved in is the evolution and conservation of migratory birds and this has been going on since uh, really since the early 90s uh, looking at levels of connectivity to inform conservation and we've gone through a series of different um, <coughs> sort of approaches to this we're now using whole gemo genome approaches to develop uh, informative SNPs to basically link breeding and wintering populations and over wintering sites and also looking at selection across the annual cycle. This effort uh, sort of morphed into the uh, bird genoscape project seven years ago when Kristen Ruag, uh, a, a previously a graduate student of mine, now a professor at Colorado State, got together and decided to create this project, the bird genoscape project. So we have many people collaborating, including Ryan Harrigan, an associate, uh, an adjunct professor here in IOES, Rachel Bay, a former postdoc who's now a professor at UC Davis, and Kelly Barr, who is um, is carrying on uh, work on the connectivity in these birds. Um, the, uh, there are a number of really interesting offshoots that I could talk for a long time about these. I'll just mention a couple of them. The first was um, the realization that these sorts of approaches could be really important for renewable energy uh, siting. And you know, this map, basically this star shows Wilson's uh, warblers and a, um, a wind, energy, energy, uh, wind energy site. And you can see that um, the, um, the timing of when birds come through that site are shown here. And in the case of California, it turns out Wilson's warblers have been declining for about 20 years. And so there's a lot of concern about these populations. But you can see when they come through here uh, in these yellow charts. And so you can get an idea of you know, what kind of mitigation approaches you might be able to use. 
uh, to reduce risk of injury. Um, another uh, study that came out of this uh, effort on migratory birds was uh, Rachel Johnson's work, a graduate student here in EEB, who looked at um, what happens when birds go through, a, 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 when birds are uh, getting ready to migrate, basically. There's these huge physiological changes that go on. And she looked at what genes are expressed differentially during that period. And so she was able to identify a number of genes that seem to be very critical in, uh, in migration. And, uh, and then the other work that came out more recently is Rachel Bay's work. Um, Rachel was very interested in sort of trying to understand how um, gene environment interactions may be changing under climate change. And uh, she identified a number of genes that are important in temperature uh, in the yellow warbler. And she coined this term uh, which, is, which we call genomic vulnerability, which is a mismatch between current and predicted future genomic variation based on genotype environment relationships modeled after contemporary uh, populations. And so you can create these maps. This is actually an approach that she expanded on from Fitzpatrick and um, uh, Fitzpatrick's work. But what was interesting about this, when you looked at that, we can say, well, this is what's going to happen in, say, 2050, is that these red areas are going to become, uh, there's going to be a greater mismatch in those areas. But when she started playing around with existing demographic data, lo and behold, she found that there was a, a strong correlation between uh, genomic vulnerability and, uh, and uh, population trends. And so she was able to say, show that um, that uh, these areas that are vulnerable are also um, declining. So it's a kind of a here and now issue with climate change, not something that you'd see in the next 50 years or so. Another area that uh, my lab's been involved in uh, for a long time, since the early 90s, is uh, looking at the ecology and conservation of rainforests. Uh, this started looking at vertebrate seed dispersers in the rainforests of uh, Central Africa, primarily uh, hornbills and, uh, and primates. And we were interested in, in movements of birds, we were interested in um, seed shadows and, and also um, um, the um, the, the deposition of seeds and, and uh, seedling growth. And so there was a whole host of projects that sort of came around this, uh, this effort to look at uh, vertebrate seed dispersers. About three years ago, this project really uh, took, took, um, took a big leap with, uh, with uh, the uh, entry of Bob Taylor, who's the president of Taylor Guitar Company. And Bob was interested in, in ebony. Um, he has a factory, a, a sawmill in Cameroon. And um, he was very interested in, in, um, in how we could restore forests and bring back ebony. And, and his, his saying is always that, well, you know, we know how to cut it down, we don't know how to grow it. And so we came on board and said, well, let's, let's develop a project around this ebony project that would um, help local communities and be a kind of stepping stone toward fo rainforest restoration. So by starting with Ebony, working with local communities, so we have, I think, uh, six nurseries now surrounding the Jaw Reserve, uh, and many of these areas are in are uh, places where they want to create corridors. We can do reforestation at the community level, but have a project that also benefits local people. So people can um, uh, sell the ebony. Of course, ebony takes a long time to grow, maybe a hundred years. But we also have, uh, we're using native fruit trees that people can grow in a couple of years and get income. So by the end of next year, we hope to have planted about 20,000 ebony trees and about 10,000 uh, native fruit trees to, um, to help these local communities. This has also been a great project for IOES students. Uh, the IOES students do a senior practicum. And so we've, this is, will be our fourth year where we've had uh, IOES uh, students engaged in this. Um, there have been a number of interesting offshoots of this particular project um, uh, involving understanding the life history of ebony, uh, especially what pollinates it and uh, what uh, disperses it. One of the recent findings suggests that elephants may be a principal disperser of ebony, which sets up some interesting questions about 
uh, carbon sequestration. Ebony is very dense wood and uh, harbors a lot of carbon and so we've been looking at a project now expanding uh, to look at stem densities and elephant densities and of course this is a critical conservation issue because we're losing about 30,000 elephants a year uh, from Africa and uh, they play this critical uh, role so we're looking at that and then finally uh, Nick Rousseau is a, is a new graduate student is in his second year now who is working on uh, passerines and also hornbills and uh, primates and looking at forest structure and using LIDAR to understand forest structure and seed rain. Still another um, area that we've focused on, this is kind of an eclectic journey that we've had with uh, looking at ecology and disease. It started off um, looking at uh, avian parasites, uh, primarily blood parasites, Hemoproteus and Plasmodia. This work was started by uh, Ravinder Segal, who was one of my uh, postdocs and then is now a professor at San Francisco State. Um, so we've been modeling and making predictive models about malaria and how it's transmitted and then there's been a, a big push looking also at uh, vector ecology and Kevin Njabo, an adjunct professor in IOES has been involved in that. And then other diseases as well. Ryan Harrigan uh, has had uh, a big effort looking at uh, West Nile virus. He had a very nice paper, sh paper showing that uh, we all sort of assumed that once West Nile hit the U.S. that um, there was clearly a dip in populations of birds that were, weren't adapted to West Nile. But it turns out that for about half the species we looked at, um, have those species have never recovered. And so there's been a, a real problem with this disease that's been persisting. Some of the other things that are going on in the lab include uh, some recent work um, that uh, Ryan has been involved with Rick Schoenberg, the chair of the stats department, look, using real-time predictions uh, of Hawks Point process models that are typically used for earthquake prediction to see how that relates to spread of Ebola. And it turns out that there's a number of um, uh, really useful approaches of this statistical technique. Um, the other area that I've been very interested in is evolution and human altered habitats. This goes back to when I, I think I was still a graduate student where I was interested in in how extinctions may change um, the morphology of birds that are dependent on certain plants. And I looked at Hawaiian honeycreepers in Hawaii and um, found that uh, bills were changing as a result of extinctions of, of lobelia. And this led to sort of a long journey of looking at evolution in human altered habitats uh, in African birds and South American birds and also some symposiums such as the one we held here at UCLA uh, in 2007 which uh, resulted in a special issue and then another one that uh, uh, took place in, in uh, Australia in 2011 and another special issue. Currently, I'm, I'm still fascinated by evolution and in, in evolution in human altered habitats, but it's kind of morphed into more of an exploration of, well, okay, these are, the, these are the patterns, what can we do about it? So is there, are there actually prescriptive evolutionary measures we can take to uh, manage evolutionary uh, processes? And that's going to get into the, the, my talk, my main talk today, which is about the importance of, uh, of preserving environmental gradients in a changing world. Um, tropical rainforests uh, harbor over half the species on the planet and are critical for con con conservation, but the, the mechanisms producing this diversity are actively debated. There are many different mechanisms of rainforest speciation. Uh, you're probably familiar with most of these, such as refugial and riverine barriers, more allopatric. Uh, mechanisms of speciation and then environmental gradients which more emphasize more of sort of an ecological speciation uh, parapatric uh, mechanism of speciation. And for the past 35 years um, my lab's been testing these alternative speciation hypotheses in South America and Australia and, uh, and also Central Africa. Most of the work in Central Africa has focused on these ecotones which uh, form this uh, sandwich between rainforest and savanna. They're about a thousand kilometers wide. They're eight million square kilometers in total area. So it's this vast area 
and you know the what we've been looking at is the is the role of these ecological gradients in driving uh, uh, differential um, uh, change in populations. If you look at these from, uh, if you look at these gradients, um, this is a nice photograph Greg took. Thanks, Greg. Um, if you look at these gradients, you look at the rainforest, one end of the gradient, you know, you have dense rainforest, you, mo you move to the end of the ecotone and you have a rainforest fragment floating in a sea of savanna. Now, if you go into this rainforest fragment in this ecotone, um, you'll find many rainforest species but they're under very different environmental conditions. Uh, it's much drier, there's less rainfall, uh, there's not as much canopy and so forth. So there are a lot of ecological uh, things that are going on. So um, the objectives for this portion of the talk is to really kind of examine uh, these alternative hypotheses for speciation and then get into some of the challenges and opportunity for conserving biodiversity um, using, uh, ensuring that we're ensuring uh, uh, under climate change, but ensuring that we're uh, um, maintaining and promoting uh, natural evolutionary processes. Um, the species that I got going on this, uh, started working on this, is the uh, little green bull, which was uh, work that I started back in uh, 1989. Uh, when I was still working on seed crackers. This is a species that occurs in many different habitats, from uh, mountain habitats on certain islands such as Bioko. But it's very common in both rainforest and ecotone. So it, it, you capture this entire gradient by looking at this species. The first thing we wanted to do was to sort of <coughs> look at the role that um, refugia might play in uh, divergence in this species and so we sampled in the upper upper guinea area where there was a hypoth hypothesized refugia and also in uh, lower guinea and then when we looked at the genetic divergence between these populations lo and behold there was evidence that they are separated um, they were isolated about two million years ago but in terms of morphology there was a very different story and that is that in terms of morphology, it was habitat, ecological uh, mechanisms that were driving the differentiation in these traits. This can be shown uh, a little clearer uh, in this photograph, or this uh, slide where you see morphological divergence on the y-axis and uh, distance on, uh, on the x-axis. And you can see here that even populations that are forest, forest populations separated by over 600 kilometers are less divergent than ecotone forest populations separated by less than 200 kilometers. And so what's really driving things here was this, this habitat uh, differential uh, that was driving these changes in fitness. So that was, that was sort of the, the, the baseline for this work. And then in 1991, I met this young man at uh, <laughs> the University of Wisconsin at a, at a conference. And Bob wasn't even at UCLA yet. He was, he was actually the head of group at the Zoological Society of London. And he said, well, you know, I, we were talking about uh, genetic methods and, you know, microsatellites were the rage back then. And so he said, well, why don't you come to uh, London and, you know, we'll, you can work in my lab and we'll figure this out. And, of course, I had just taken a job <laughs> at San Francisco State, so I went to talk to my chair and I said, you know, it's great having this job, but now I want to leave for six months. And it was like, well, okay. So anyway, what Bob and I did was to sort of test this uh, idea of divergence across these gradients using the divergence with gene flow model of speciation, which came out around the same time. There was this review paper by Rice and Hostard that suggested that what's really important in understanding speciation in Drosophila isn't whether things are in allopatry or sympatry, but rather the magnitude of gene flow and the magnitude of selection. So it's sort of the precursor to folks who study ecological speciation. And so speciation is going to be more likely, obviously, when gene flow is low and divergence selection is, is high. And we could make uh, some different predictions based on this. Uh, we, um, instead of using divergent selection, we could use morphological divergence as an index because the traits we were working on had to do with, uh, were closely correlated with fitness. And then there were two, um, two expectations here. You'd expect, um, let's see, I'm sure that's a, uh, 
a very important call, but anyway. Um, so there are two expectations here, both uh, within habitat comparisons, ecotone, ecotone and rainforest, rainforest, and that should, you should see that across a range of gene flow, but there should be relatively little morphological divergence because you're, you're comparing populations within the same habitat. And ecotone rainforest pop comparisons, which would sit above this, uh, showing this driving effect of eco ecology on these traits. So, we applied uh, some genetic uh, methods, uh, in this case microsatellites to this, we measured gene flow, we looked at morphological divergence, and lo and behold we got this pattern that seemed to fit this divergence with gene flow model of speciation. But there were many questions that <coughs> obviously came out of this, and one of the first to ex we explored was, well, okay, there's, there's evidence for divergence with, uh, divergence with gene flow, but what are the traits that are really important here in prezygotic isolation? And so one of the things we did was to look at uh, song, avian song, and this work was done with Hans Slaverkorn, who is a postdoc of mine, who's now a professor at Leiden. And what Hans did is went out and measured song from various habitats in both ecotone and forest, and he found significant differences in frequency and delivery rate and so forth. We, uh, so that was interesting. There was clearly differences in song. We took this a next <coughs> step further by looking at it across larger spatial scales. And this was uh, work that I did with Ryan Harrigan, which was to use remote sensing data to basically develop a predictive model for what kind of song it would be, a song a bird would be singing uh, from space. So it was kind of an interesting idea. And lo and behold, we were able to show very uh, well that in fact um, this predictive model uh, explained about 67 percent of the variation in s maximum frequency and this sort of shows you this graphically so this is the four zone and this blue area is the ecotone um, but you know so you might assume from this that as we did initially that oh well this must have to do with the structure of the habitat you know the physical structure of the forest and but we set out to test that and what uh, we did was to generate an artificial song and play it back through uh, ecotone and, and rainforest habitats looking at both low frequency and high frequency and we found no differences. So the sound basically travels the same through these two different habitats. <coughs> we think why this is the case is that even though I mentioned that canopies are different in the ecotone, these birds um, occur during in the in the lower ground uh, and uh, near the ground and undergrowth. And so, you know, I, you're just not getting frequency differences at that height in the in the forest. So, um, with a little bit more exploration, um, we thought that. Uh, well, maybe this has to do with ambient noise, because one of the things that you notice very readily if you're in a rainforest is just how deafening the noise is from things like stridulating insects. And sure enough, when we compared ecotone forests, rainforest looks like this. It's just most of the, uh, most of the bandwidth here is taken up by uh, noisy insects, and so if you're a if you're a bird trying to attract a mate or defend a territory and you're singing in one of these areas where there's, uh, there's very, little an uh, <coughs> uh, uh, very little noise space essentially to, to be heard, um, it's going to shift your, um, your songs. And so this is what we think is going on because it, in the ecotone you have none of this ambient noise. It's a much drier habitat. We took this a next step. <coughs> uh, this was work uh, by Alex Kershaw, one of uh, uh, Dan Blumstein's uh, graduate students, uh, to look at, um, well, okay, so we know there are differences in song, but are birds really noticing these differences? Are they really reacting differentially? And so what Alex did was to take uh, rainforest song, record rainforest song from Cameroon, and then he played it back to rainforest birds in Cameroon and Uganda. And uh, first of all, if you play back rainforest song to rainforest birds in Cameroon, uh, there's very high approach distance. In other words, the, f the males will come in and actually even try to attack the speaker. Um, likewise, 
go to the same habitat 3,000 kilometers away in Uganda and you got a not at that very similar rela uh, uh, situation where the birds are really recognizing that song even though you've you've uh, really traveled across the continent yet if you um, drive 50 kilometers north from where this site is into the ecotone um, the reaction to those calls uh, was really diminished so you know to summarize this then in terms of these results at this point we found that there were you know morphological differences in fitness traits patterns of differential uh, this pattern of divergence with gene flow and we found these song differences and response differences but the nagging question remained was you know are these populations along the gradient actually genetically divergent or not and to get at this question um, we uh, we started looking at <coughs> SNPs and generating uh, uh, to try to understand the uh, to estimate levels of genetic diversity, examine fine scale population structure, and identify if we could some candidate loci and understand some of the biological functions of those loci. We're still sort of in this realm with this project, but uh, this work was done by uh, Yang Zhen who is a graduate student here, uh, both in my lab and Kirk's lab, who's now a professor in China. Um, we sampled our populations across the range of virins, and uh, we used uh, RAD-seq, but we also used RNA-seq uh, to um, help assemble, um, a de no to do an, a de novo assembly of the transcriptome so we can understand something about the, some of the coding sequences as well. But we generated about 50,000 SNPs and um, we were off to the races. Well, one of the things that came out very quickly was that um, SNPs were doing an amazing job at differentiating not just these broad habitats such as ecotone and forest, but actually along the gradient, look at these sites, they just follow, the, these sites are coded in different colors and they followed um, the gradient almost perfectly. So we were fi finding this very fine scale genetic patterning uh, in, um, in those, I I across the gradient. So this was really the first evidence that uh, you know these this species was actually genetically differentiating across the gradient, and um, so we were pretty excited about that. We went on to do various outlier analyses and look for candidate genes and things like that. <coughs> I don't want to dwell on this because you know there's a lot more work that be done, but just to point out a couple of genes, there are genes such as MLXIPL, which uh, won't mean much to anybody, but it's an important gene in, in determining body size of birds. So there's been work on chicken and you know one of the things that you find with burins is that uh, birds are show significant body size shifts along the gradient. Another gene that was interesting is uh, EDIL3 which has to do with the biomineralization of eggshells and as you know uh, birds lay a uh, different porosity of uh, their eggs are have different porosity their eggshells have different porosity based on relative humidity and so <coughs> we're this is very much a a, um, a, a a humidity gradient and rainfall gradient and so seeing genes like this uh, being important was also uh, you know made sense we also wanted to look at uh, sort of this spatially looking at how environmental variables were associated with genomic variation and so we used uh, random forests uh, to try to do this uh, looking at temperature variables, elevation and any other variables. It turned out that temperature variables seem to be very important as well as elevation and uh, one could then essentially map um, these patterns uh, uh, across the range and one of the th patterns you see here is where there's a change in, in uh, variation of these associations between uh, allele frequency and environmental variables. You see that in the ecotone here as you go from more forest to ecotone and you also see it as you go up in elevation. Now I don't have time to talk about the, um, the patterns that you find along elevational gradients but it's, it's very much a complementary story. So 
Um, this is sort of where we were at, um, at the beginning of about maybe five years ago. And <coughs> we decided to um, expand out on this project um, to try to look at this across species and also integrate um, uh, information that could be important in understanding how to preserve this biodiversity we see in Africa uh, under climate change. So the, uh, obviously the, the rainforests of, of the Congo Basin are incredibly important. They harbor one out of every five species. Uh, folks may not realize that they're also extremely important in carbon. It turns out the Congo Basin harbors more carbon in its, in its peat bogs and, and, and soils than the Amazon and tropical Asia combined. And this was, a, uh, this was a fact that came out in a paper last spring by a graduate student at Ghent University. We didn't know that before, so super important. Um, the first scramble for Africa occurred between 1881 and 1914. Um, and in the first scramble, European powers invaded, occupied, and annexed an African territories to secure natural resources. This is a famous cartoon of Cecil Rhodes from 1892, uh, sort of sizing up Africa for uh, European coloniz colonizers. Um, now there's a second scramble for Africa, but this scramble isn't Europe anymore. It's, it's, it's for Africa's natural resources and it's being led by China. And the, the pressure is uh, to feed the middle class, the consumer goods they're going to need. Uh, so there's a huge demand for resources and the Congo Basin is in the crosshairs. This is just one photograph I pulled out of a recent article. This is a, a diamond mine near one of my study sites. This is how mining is taking place. In fact, there, uh, there are a hundred of these mines just in the vicinity of Maganga in central Cameroon. So this is just part of the equation, of course, because what China is doing with the One Belt Road is massively developing infrastructure uh, across Africa. So this is mining, logging, uh, deep water ports, and turning many of these uh, countries into, into what essentially are called debt traps, where the country says, sure, come on in, and then they can't service the debt these countries can't service the debt. And so what happens is that um, China has tremendous leverage. So those diamond mines I mentioned are protected by the Cameroon army, even though they're not uh, official mines. Uh, visas are also a thing that uh, China is very much involved in. Um, there, uh, um, the China recently negotiated a million visas for Cameroon from Chinese, and this and Cameroon has a population of 20 million people. So we're talking about 5% of the population. So, you know, there are these huge uh, issues going on. There's deep water ports. This one in Kribi um, was a port that was, I had a study area here. <laughs> this was one of my first study areas that I started. And I came back, you know, after uh, a couple of years to resample and, and this port was being built. This is the port in Kribi. And it's the terminus to uh, a whole infrastructure of roads and, and railroads stretching across to Kenya. Um, just to give you a sense of the <coughs> magnitude of some of the impacts, um, the, uh, the port uh, last spring loaded a Vietnamese freighter with 10,000 cubic meters of logs, which is the equivalent, if you do the math, of 350 logging trucks on one ship. So um, things are going things are really uh, moving very quickly and I you know so welcome to the second scramble for Africa um, so Africa on top of all of that is predicted to be severely affected by climate change uh, these numbers are probably conservative at this point but you know we're looking at probably 40 percent of plants and animals at risk of extinction if uh, average rise in mean temperature exceeds three degrees we're already at two degrees in many parts of Africa and so, <coughs> with all of this going on, but still the interest in understanding speciation and the processes that produce and maintain biodiversity, we, colleagues and I developed a, uh, a PIRE grant, Partnerships for International Research and Education, to 
with the goal of developing a framework for conserving Central African biodiversity under climate change that was both evolutionary informed and grounded in the socioeconomics of the region. This was a, a large grant, five-year grant. It's still, I think it, this particular grant ends in December. Uh, we had 40 scientists from four continents and 25 universities and research institutions. So this was a big deal. Um, one of the first things, just parenthetically, we had to do is to change the name of the pyre. How many people speak French? Well, if you speak French, you know pier means the worst. You know, something is pier, pier it's like the worst. So, you know, we realized pretty quickly that we couldn't have a name of a project being the worst project on, you know, so and so and so. So, so anyway, we had to do some, some marketing there and changing things a little bit. But we came up with this scenario for um, looking at um, basically um, integrating uh, information on species from butterflies to chimpanzees to basically develop a prioritization that included the, the usual kinds of things that you look at such as species richness and endemism and so forth <coughs> but incorporating also information about uh, uh, genetic diversity, phenotypic diversity, and also future climate to understand how we can get here with a prioritization scheme that's going to be useful for us in the future. We did this for, uh, as I said, these nine different species. Um, we don't have time to summarize all of them. I'm just going to summarize two. Um, but the patterns were recurrent, that, that the, the ecotone and this gradient was, was important. And so if you look at um, chimpanzees, you find a similar sort of situation between forest and ecotone. They seem to be diverging along that gradient. And um, the more recent work on uh, skinks is, is pretty exciting. This was work done by uh, Adam Friedman, a former graduate student who's now at Harvard as a research scientist. But it was the first time that um, with Adam's work, we were actually able to uh, do some demographic modeling. So this is the structure plot over here showing forest and uh, ecotone populations. But then he did a, um, a daddy demographic modeling F approach to see what were the patterns of, rain f uh, of gene flow historically. And what he found was really interesting that gene flow was higher historically and then ceased recently. So what that means is that that supports the, um, the gradient model of speciation because we've gone from high gene flow to no gene flow. If this was allopatric uh, speciation, you'd expect no gene flow historically and then integration through secondary contact. So this is a direction we're going to be going with these studies to try to <coughs> combine uh, demographic modeling with each of these species. But what we wanted to do with the, on, the, on the pyre work was to try to integrate um, all of these onto a single map because that's what decision makers need. And this was an attempt to do that. And you can see that um, we blocked out um, forest concessions and also mining areas. On here we have green areas which are uh, current reserves. And then you can sort of spot with your eye you can look and see where the changes in, uh, in variation occur from uh, high variation to low variation and so forth in those areas. So those are areas where there's a lot of, um, of, of, of basically variation, genetic variation across, uh, across distance. Um, then the next question was, well, let's, how do we integrate? Uh, the next question was to integrate um, climate change into these maps and um, to look at, first of all, how future climate change and population evolvability can be integrated into planning, how, how much do populations need to evolve to maintain genomic and environmental relationships, and which populations are going to be most variable using these nine species. Uh, we went back to this approach of genomic vulnerability just to reiterate that that's the mismatch between current and predicted future genomic variation based on genomic environment relationships modeled across contemporary uh, populations. This was an idea that really came out of a paper in uh, ecological letters by um, um, by uh, Fitzpatrick and Keller that was co-opted by us to, to sort of look at look at uh, this variability in this mapping exercise. Um, so when we do that, when we look at genomic vulnerability on the map I just showed you, 
you basically end up with this really big red blob here, a very high genomic vulnerability. So <clears throat> most of the country in the central areas uh, from the central Cameroon going up uh, from you know the border of Gabon up to Chad is this area of high genomic vulnerability. So you can make the, you can make the case that to, to persist in this bright red area 50 years from now we'll need to evolve at a rate 300 times faster than they have done since the last glacial maximum. Now that's assuming that most of the morphological or the adaptive variation we see um, you know has sort of evolved uh, <coughs> importantly since the last glacial maximum but you can see that that's a that's going to be a pretty pretty high bar to get to. It's going to be very few populations that will be able to evolve that quickly. This is under a 2080 scenario, a moderate scenario of RCP 4.5 there's a couple of caveats here that um, you should be aware of. First of all, the climate models for Central Africa aren't all that great. We used the best we could, but you know there may be others out there that may show a rosier or even a more serious um, pattern. Um, a lot of it has to do with the uncertainty of what the Atlantic Ocean is going to do under climate change in terms of warming, so it's hard to make these predictions. The other caveat is that um, this doesn't, uh, doesn't examine the importance of micro refugia areas. And, and God hope us that, <laughs> that we will have regional differences that will preserve some species. So in the case of chimpanzees, you know, they're not going to be able to move out of these areas. They're going to be trapped here, but if perhaps they're, you know, in riparian areas and, and so forth, that micro refugial uh, areas could be um, possible for them to continue to um, survive in. So what we did next was to sort of develop these um, sort of prioritizing areas uh, based on uh, where um, there's a lot of turnover in genetic variation and low genomic vulnerability to sort of get an idea of where could we prioritize either new protected areas or converting um, current areas where there's uh, forest concessions into something that could be important for biodiversity. There's some efforts underway and some significant money behind uh, trying to identify these areas. There's this program called Campaign for Nature that's trying to, sort of like E.O. Wilson that wants 50% of all countries, or 50% of the biodiversity of the land area to be protected for biodiversity. The 30 by 30 uh, approach is to try to protect 30% <coughs> of every country in the next 30 years. So I think there's some some possibilities to to generate some interest in that area for areas like this. Um, one of the things we did in December and what we're still doing, we've been holding a series of workshops. So this is one of the workshops we did in Cameroon in December where we get together with policy makers and, and try to um, uh, present our data and get them interested in um, in designing uh, their conservation decisions around uh, information that's going to be useful in under future climate scenarios. We've held workshops, we've done the same sort of mapping exercise in Gabon, we've had the same uh, <coughs> uh, workshop, we had a similar workshop in Gabon as we did here in Cameroon. So I guess to kind of finish up, I guess, you know, it's the, the question is still, the nagging question is where can we find answers to the challenges facing Central Africa? I mean, you, you sum up all of these, you know, major development efforts, uh, high population and so forth. Um, what can we do? And I think, I, I still think there's a tremendous potential for Africa, but, but to be blunt, uh, the world has really failed this continent. For 35 years, the 35 years I've been working there, I've seen Western NGOs and universities, they come in, they parachute in, they're there for a short period of time and we have very little to show for it. Um, they also tend to work in silos, so there isn't the integration that's needed to really solve problems. Um, we haven't built much of a scientific infrastructure. We haven't left intellectual capital or policy relationships that are really meaningful. We haven't really built much at all. And uh, so it's really no surprise that, you know, Africa has, you know, these, these major issues uh, surrounding it. Uh, you know, if you look at brain drain, of the, of the folks that go overseas for higher degrees in Cameroon, only 20% come back. 
you know, of the 700 universities, there are only 700, 700 universities in Africa for 1.2 billion people. Africa has the lowest R&D investment rate. It's about less than 1%. You know, Europe and the U.S. is two, between 2.5 and 3. Um, and if you sum up all the authors of the 80 most prestigious journals in the world, 0.2% um, uh, represent authors from Central Africa. And so, you know, you've got a major, we've got a, some major uh, challenges ahead. 44% uh, of the African population is under the age of 15. They're going to be hitting university age in another two years. And by 2035, there'll be more Africans entering the workforce than the rest of the world combined. And that's going to stay that way until the end of the century. So what we're looking at really here is a perfect storm of overwhelming need for expertise and very little supply. So what does Africa need to counter that storm? Um, what, what's going to make these solutions real? First of all, it needs scholars and scientists staying home, nurtured, and supported. It means solving problems at home, working across disciplines with policymakers. And that's a lot to ask. Um, and so the question is, can we get there? And I, I think we can. I, I, I think if we, if we put our mind to it, um, there is potential here. And I, I've been part of this effort, a uh, small effort, to create the Congo Basin Institute, CBI for short, uh, to try to do this. And um, what we've been doing is to, um, with CBI, is this network is focused on integration, environmental sustainability, looking at the challenges of food and water, su uh, water security, human health, conservation, climate change mitigation, all of these things. Um, so CBI is essentially, it's, it's ground up, it's homegrown, interdisciplinary, and it's headquartered in Cameron. We started it five years ago, but we're now operating in uh, six different countries. The network now, as of last week, actually has 17 partners, uh, three UCs, including UCLA, Davis, and Riverside. Cornell just joined last week. And um, so we have these partners that are bringing in their expertise in terms of workshops, classes, and also research. Um, so what does CBI mean overall? And I think it means several things. It means, first of all, we're trying to create something that's permanent. Uh, we're trying to build an institution based in Africa for Africans, not in Paris or New York, which is often the case. Uh, we're trying to build uh, facilities that are green facilities that utilize local materials. We've built a GIS lab. We have, um, we're putting in an ASHA grant for a, a distance learning center, uh, which we hope will be funded. And uh, so that's the permanent aspect. The other thing is it's local. Uh, you know, we're working with local uh, academicians and, and universities. This guy in the middle is Eric Fokum. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Bouya. When I first met Eric seven years ago, uh, he had done his PhD at the University of Texas, and he could have gone anywhere for a job. He had a, he had a great research background. He could have gone to Europe, stayed in the States. But he decided to come back uh, to Africa. When I met him seven years ago, he was in a lab with one graduate student and a room full of broken equipment. And, you know, it's just the kind of guy who said, well, I tried it, I'm going to have to bail and go back to Europe or the States. Now, because of CBI and our partners, um, he has six collaborative grants and he has 14 graduate students, nine of whom are women, working on some of the most important issues in Central Africa from amphibian declines, ch climate change, uh, the reemergence of Zika virus and so forth. So um, that's the, the local aspect of this can't be, um, you know, uh, under uh, emphasized. The other thing, and I love this photograph, it's interdisciplinary. I mean, when you go to Africa, typically there's very little exchange between countries. You're, you know, they're different. Every country has its own silo, and there isn't this effort to bringing people together. But because of the Pyre grant and because of some of the other grants that we've been able to get, we've been able to bring people in from different countries to develop, to do workshops and courses, but also to do collaborative research. This is Max, uh, Max Farrow from UNHE in the blue. He's a professor at the University of Equatorial Guinea. And this 
this is uh, Gerard Tassi, one of Eric's students who works on frogs. So Max is a plant systematist and, and they're now collaborating uh, on different projects. So we're seeing this exchange between countries. Finally, uh, CBI is scalable. And that's because when we created it, we partnered with the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture, which has been in Africa for 50 years. It was started by the Ford and Rockefeller Foundation and has a network of uh, campuses and stations across Africa. So we don't have to create something new. We can just layer on uh, efforts from our different partners in these different areas. So for example, we started in Cameroon. We're now working in uh, DRC. We have a project that's starting up in CAR. Uh, we have another one that we hope to start in Rwanda, all of which can utilize this existing uh, uh, infrastructure, so we don't have to create a new infrastructure, which is very expensive, and you know, for each university to have its own campus, it just doesn't make any sense. It makes much more sense to, to try to partner. So um, I think the only way forward is, is to, to be successful, I think, in Central Africa is to put is to put Africa at the center of Africa's solutions. And, and that's the formula we've been trying to use. And that's the formula that we're hoping now to expand. Um, so I think the, you know, the second scramble is on, uh, but I think we have an opportunity uh, to make it about sustainability for people, uh, Africa, uh, people, Africa's people, science, biodiversity, and the planet, and do something that can hopefully save, uh, can maximize the potential for saving uh, species and um, and uh, provide for humans. So finding that win-win for human and, and biodiversity. So I think I'll leave it there and, and answer any questions. Yeah. So when you were talking about the mapping of the Well, so what we're really looking at is areas of turnover where genetic variation is maximized. So sometimes that's an ecotone area, sometimes it's not. Uh, and uh, the idea there is that we're, we're trying to preserve, we're trying to maximize the amount of, of, of variation because we don't know what's going to come. It's a bed hedging approach that we're taking. But we're also integrating that information with you know, information on endemism, species richness. So it's, there are all these other things that feed into that. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of linked with the earlier topics of this thing. Later on, so you talked about the evolutionary rate, evolution rates in the urbanized areas and, and this need for rapid evolution in these certain areas and, and because of climate change. And I know you're saying there's a way to it. And not saying that we should urbanize it because things might evolve faster in those areas. But, but you know, if you could take lessons learned from um, the urban environment. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's a really interesting question. <clears throat> I mean, I'm really, uh, we, we wrote a review paper on this idea of using kind of prescriptive uh, evolutionary uh, approaches. Uh, and I think that uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done in that area. I think there's, um, just like there's around LA, there's a lot of opportunity for kind of urban uh, wildlife, uh, you know, um, conservation and we need to be thinking about that and you know for example in the big cities uh, such as Yaoundé and Douala there's there's a there are a lot of savanna species that are moving in those areas because you know cre people have created savanna so they're species that you wouldn't normally f you wouldn't have found there 200 years ago so um, I mean you can look at that as a bad thing but you can also think well you know we've created some places where those species can still persist in those human environments. So it's the same sort of things we think about in the Santa Monica Mountains and around LA. So it's a really important area to, to, to investigate. I think that the problem is gets into certain keystone species like elephant uh, that don't do well with humans, obviously, and uh, are being lost at a you know accelerating rate. I mean, elephants, when we talk about the loss of ivory, which is horrible in Africa, you know, that's just the tip of the ecological iceberg. They, elephants disperse 100 species of tree. And so, uh, and we already know that, you know, probably 90% of the trees 
are dispersed by vertebrates. And so we've got some real issues around loss of genetic variation uh, in, in many trees. We've documented it in some species, even genetically, showing that in hunted areas, genetic neighborhoods are 50% smaller. So there's, there's a myriad of, of things that um, we're going to have to figure out. But we can also leverage opportunities about, for example, um, leveraging natural processes to increase seed rain into those areas. So putting up nest boxes. So big trees with cavities, what happens in, in, in secondary forest, they get cut down, but if you put up nest boxes, you can bring hornbills in and increase um, uh, you know, seed rain and regrowth that way. But anyway, lots of different questions. Yeah. yeah. So your talk, you emphasize sort of landscape change and climate change. You just mentioned hunting. And so are you working actively on the sort of more deliberate human impacts directly on wildlife? And do you see a future, you know, are you scoping out solutions there as well? Yeah, the hunting problem is a big, <coughs> is a multifaceted beast because, as you know, it's it's tied in with protein, and people need protein, and they have to get it somehow. Um, but I think there are some opportunities uh, for uh, for creating landscapes that are, um, for example, um, where some animals can be harvested sustainably. I mean, you know, in Pennsylvania, we harvest 150,000 deer a year, okay, but this is a sustainable population. It's, it's game management 101. And I, and I think those are, there are possibilities for those sorts of, so, sort of studies in Africa. And, and so one of the things we're talking about is, is uh, there's not, the, the government isn't going to create new protected areas. I mean, I think that's just off the, you know, off the table. But there are forest concessions, okay, that are massive forest concessions that have already been logged. And so one idea is to go in and manage those areas, get the lease from the government, and, uh, and, and set up uh, your own sort of reserves where you can sort of begin to look at some of these things, manage diker populations and, and things like that to, 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 to see if you can uh, develop a, um, a way to um, where some of these species can be harvested sustainably. And there have been a few studies uh, in Central Africa and you know I, I know I'm familiar with a couple of where they've actually worked if the people understand you know what, what's at stake. They can't go in and just hunt everything because there won't be anything for them and, and same in fisheries. But it's a you know the other thing is that Africa it's a long game you know it's you can try these things but it may take a while so. Yeah. Okay, thanks guys. <laughs>